the first time <clears throat> he'd been in New York since 31, right? I mean, uh, it's working. Yes, I... Are we on? We're on now. Right. Yes, it's the first time I've been on a stage in New York since 1931, and very early 1931, it was January. And what does it mean to you to be back? What is what? What does it mean to you to be back? Oh, it's absolutely splendid. I've been here twice on, um, on, on visits, very short visits, but to come back and come, go onto the stage was very nerve-wracking, both in London and on arrival here. But fortunately, um, I got over that because I felt the friendliness and the warmth of the people around me. And that meant a lot, coming back and be, being received with such warm welcome. What do you feel about Black Broadway as a show itself? Oh, I love it. I, well, I love all the people in it. I've, I've re-met many of that I've met over the years, of course. Um, Bubbles, I met in London many years ago, and, so, and Bubba, they were the three dukes. And um, of course, Adelaide, I've known right through the years. And um, Edith, Edith Wilson, really, I met in London. Uh, I knew about her, of course, but I first met her in London. I can't remember what it was she was in. Neither can she, for that matter. But um, uh, I'd never met Nell and uh, who else did I? I think uh, the, the rest of my, I, I'd met, yes. Mm. Uh, who else have we? Um, this is a terrible pause. Bobby and the dancers. Oh, well, Bobby, Bob, Bobby Short, that's right. The dancers, of course, are new to me. And, uh, and, and I'd seen um, a Mercedes Ellington, but I hadn't met her when I was here about 10 years ago. She was in the chorus of No, 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 Net. And uh, it was lovely to meet her and know her because any connection with the Duke is for me, well, history. Tell us about Duke Ellington. I didn't know him terribly well. I, I, when I was starting, of course, he was the, the big uh, noise at the Cotton Club in Harlem. And uh, me being a 63rd Street kid, uh, he was almost like a, a historical name. Uh, I met him, finally, only in London again, because um, I was in London and I was in a show at the Leicester Square Theatre singing um, Stormy Weather. <laughs> and I, beat you, I introduced uh, Stormy Weather to London in uh, 1933. I'd been singing it in Paris and I beat Duke about a week to 10 days. And then he arrived with his fantastic orchestra I was um, what you call a, a success with stormy weather because it, it was a huge success. And, uh, but of course, Duke arrived with this fantastic orchestra and a fabulous orchestration and this wonderful Ivy Anderson singing. And so they made it the world hit, actually. They really introduced it to Europe and made it a hit. Now you're reintroducing it in New York at Black Broadway. Yes, I'm introducing it in New York and Black Broadway. And funnily enough, there's a film just opened in London, uh, a treatment of the Shakespeare's The Tempest. <laughs> and you won't believe this, but I'm in it as a goddess and I'm singing Stormy Weather. <laughs> so, it's part of my life, Ethel Waters. Tell us a little bit about Waters. Again, I met her in Paris. I never met her in New York. She was there visiting, and this would be about 131, or 30, I, think, I think 32. And um, she, I was singing at the Chez Florence in Paris, and she came in. And, uh, of course, she had that fantastic smile, that beautiful grin. She had all those lovely teeth. And I adored her. I only knew her as a person. Not, not, I mean, what I meant is that as, uh, socially I knew her, but I, I never worked with her in the theater or cabaret. But I loved her very, very much. She was a lovely person. Is there a message in Black Broadway to, to you or to the world that you think has any meaning? In Black Broadway, I've been asked, is there a message in Black Broadway? I think, yes, there is a message in Black Broadway. There's a message saying that the, the black artist or 
in my time, they were called Negroes or Coloreds, were admired, copied, and, um, and almost envied by some of the great artists because certainly they took a lot of uh, what they saw in the black artists and, and put it into their own works. And I also feel that in spite of prejudice of those days, there was a great, um, among artists, and always has been and still is, a great admiration for their work and, and them as persons. And I think the black artist then had much more elegance and dignity in whatever they did, whether they were comics or dancers or singers or whatever, or actors. I had great respect for them myself. Um, some of the artists in those days you were very close with, uh, uh, they had an influence on your life, for instance, Bojangles, Bill Robinson. Yes, uh, that was in Blackbirds of 1928. Uh, well, start, with, start, with, start with his name, Bojangles. Bill Robinson, Bojangles. <laughs> he, he was absolutely superb. Uh, we were together in, or rather I was with him because he was a star with Adelaide Hall and Ada Ward in the Blackbirds of 1928, Lou Leslie, of course. And... Um, it was in that show that I really began doing things, and I always give Lou Leslie the credit for, if there's such a thing as credit for, for at least he launched me. He gave me bits in, uh, with the comedians, <laughs> and one spot with a famous black faced comedian called uh, Johnny Hudgens. And Bill Robinson, Bojangles, was of course the showstopper forever and ever, amen. <laughs> And he, um, he was the first one that uh, asked me to do a recording. Uh, he said, I, uh, Elizabeth, I'd like you to sing the song that I sing when I do my speciality. You know, he's up and down the stage, up and down the steps. And that was called Doing the New Low Down. <laughs> and this voice, sang, this young voice sang it. It's somewhere around now, I believe. I think it's Brunswick, I can't remember. But um, that was my first recording. And thank you, Bill. <laughs> uh, Adelaide was in that show. As, as, uh, other than the fact that she's 50 years older, has she changed much as a performer since? Uh... Now, Adelaide Hall was in that show, of course, because she did Digga Digga Do. And there was a person that the people forget to mention was Ada Ward. They too, the, uh, the two of those artists, uh, replaced the great and supreme Florence Mills, because she had died the year before, and Leslie, uh, Lou Leslie had set up the show, 1928, more or less, for Florence Mills. And uh, he had Adelaide Hall and Ada Ward doing the bits that Florence Mills was, was to have done. Uh, Adelaide did Digga Digga Do, and she did the duet with um, Ada Ward of I Can't Give You Anything But Love. And uh, what else did she do? Um, uh, I must have that man was her, 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 her solo speciality. And she was absolutely marvelous, very beautiful, and, um, and danced very well. Of course, I never could dance, so I always admired dancers. <laughs> and I still can't dance, but I, 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 I dance on the floor. I have rhythm and I have movement, but I can't tap and all that thing. But what was it about Florence Mills that made her such a legend, other than the fact she died young? Was she really so great? Well, I saw her one Thanksgiving, yes, yes, I beg him. <laughs> now, Florence Mills, I saw her when I was, uh, it was a Thanksgiving treat because they, they opened in the street that I was born in, Daly 63rd Street. And um, I was taken to see her, even as a child, she had a fascination. I, she, she, wasn't, she wasn't real, strangely enough. Um, I think that's probably why she died. She wasn't, she wasn't of the earth. I never knew her, I never got to, to meet her. But the person that inspired me, I, I remember her funeral. And I remember, it, I was so touched by it. And I don't know why. And it, it, what, what amazes me now is that here I am in, uh, in um, New York, where she started her career and is loved and known. 
and I'm singing one of her songs that few people know. This amazes me. And why I'm singing it is because I recorded it for Charles B. Cochran in London in 1934. Because Charles B. Cochran, when I came to London, called me to his office and he said, I want to talk to you about Florence Mills. And I said, well, I don't know her. I only know her work. And he went on. He absolutely adored this woman. He said she was one of the world geniuses. He, everybody in London, I think, truly, in London, she is more loved and respected and still known and mentioned than she is in New York. I would, I would presume that. But uh, Charles B. Cochran, of course, he, it was he who brought her to London. And he told me some of the most marvelous stories about her. And she's always been, I don't know, she's always been sort of over my shoulder somehow. And I don't know why. And that's why it's, it's very touching to sing Silver Rose. Tell us about that. How should I start? Let's see. Um, uh, yeah, I seem uh, of course, I'm introduced in the Black Broadway as having sung Love for Sale on Broadway in the New Yorkers. That is very true. But a lot of the story of my entry into the New Yorkers is, is absolutely bunk because it, it was made into a terrible story of prejudice, racial prejudice, by the press when the New Yorkers opened, I was singing in a nightclub called the Royal Box. I can't remember where it was, but it was somewhere in the 50s east side. And um, I had been giving a, given a copy of Love for Sale before the show opened by a, a very well-known personality called uh, Peggy Hopkins Joyce. And she said, this would be a very good song for you to put in your repertoire. I said, fine. And I learned it, you see. And so the, after the show opened, immediately the show opened, uh, I put it in my repertoire because we weren't allowed to otherwise. And um, when the press came out about the New Yorkers, uh, most of the critics were just talking about the, the, the presentation of the song Love for Sale, which had been done by a lovely little girl. Uh, and I say little, she was little. She was very pink and white and with lovely blonde hair, and she looked like a, nowadays we'd call her a nymphette, but, but that hadn't been uh, reckoned on in those days. And she had three similar types of girls behind her as a backup group, singing Love for Sale. Well, when you read the lyrics, which for me is poetry, uh, you can't give it to a, a girl of that age and, and looks. Uh, she almost had uh, pigtails and, and, and a, a, a school satchel <laughs> over her shoulder. And the critics picked on this and they slated Cole to such a degree that he was so annoyed and so hurt, because he was a very sensitive person. Um, he left, I believe, two or three days after the show opened. And then there was great controversy about this song, should it be taken out, why did Cole Porter write it, et cetera, et cetera. And yet the show was never discussed because it was a marvelous show. And they had fabulous artists in it. They had Clayton Jackson and Durante. They had Pen Waring's Pennsylvanians on the pit, in the pit and on the stage. They had Francis Williams. They had Francis, um, uh, uh, Francis Williams and um, Hope Williams. And they had Dennis King and oh, so many wonderful people. And Anne Pennington, who became a great friend of mine. And uh, <laughs> they, Finally, one night I was just about to go home when I was singing at the, at the Royal Box and the manager came over and he said, uh, Elizabeth, there's three gentlemen out here to hear you sing. And I said, what, at this time? And uh, they said, yes, they want just you to sing Love for Sale for them. So to cut a long story short, they turned out to be uh, Ray Getz, uh, Irving Berlin and uh, Monty Woolley. Uh, Irving was a great friend of Cole Porter's. Ray Getz and Monty Woolley were both producers and directors of the show, The New Yorkers. And I sang Love for Sale. And then my, the hearsay was that um, Ray Getz said, but she's colored, which is a natural thing to say. And, uh, and uh, Irving Berlin said, but if you want her, and if she's singing the song the way you want it sung, then it's up to you to make a presentation. That was the story.
And the presentation they made after a week of quibbling was that instead of the Park Avenue on the stage set, they changed it to Lenox Avenue. And instead of the canopy that, in which all the people dressed beautifully, as in um, uh, Lawrence Hart's song, Emeralds and Pearls Going to Harlem, uh, they made it the Cotton Club. It, it was Rubens originally on the stage, which was a famous uh, uh, club at that time. And they changed Rubens to the Cotton Club and they changed Park Avenue to Lenox Avenue. And I was very well dressed in some beautiful black satin and, and black patent leather shoes with red heels and a red boa and a little sort of titfa on with uh, black feathers. And I went on and sang Love for Sale in the same set. Somebody said the other day I sang it as a cabaret. But that's not true. It was the same set, a street scene with a cop, as, no, as Cole Porter wrote it, when the only sound on the empty street is the heavy tread of the heavy feet. And that was it. Okay. Uh, the first time <clears throat> you've been in New York since 31, right? I mean, uh, it's working. Yes, I... Are we on? We're on now. Right. Yes, it's the first time I've been on a stage in New York since 1931. And very early 1931, it was January. And what does it mean to you to be back? What is what? What does it mean to you to be back? Oh, it's absolutely splendid. I've been here twice on, uh, on, on visits, very short visits. But to come back and come, go onto the stage was very nerve-wracking, both in London and Harlem. And uh, me being a 63rd Street kid, uh, he was almost like a, a historical name. Uh, I met him, finally, only in London again, because um, I was in London and I was in a show at the Leicester Square Theatre singing um, Stormy Weather. <laughs> and I, beat you, I introduced uh, Stormy Weather to London in uh, 1933. I'd been singing it in Paris and I beat Duke and on arrival here. But fortunately, um, I got over that because I felt the friendliness and the warmth of the people around me. And that meant a lot, coming back and be, being received with such warm welcome. What do you feel about Black Broadway as a show itself? Oh, I love it. I, well, I love all the people in it. I've, I've re-met many that I've met over the years, of course. Um, Bubbles, I met in London many years ago, and, so, and Bubba. They were the ones. Bobby and the dancers. Oh, well, Bobby, Bob, Bobby Short, that's right. The dancers, of course, are new to me. And, uh, and, and I'd seen um, a Mercedes Ellington, but I hadn't met her when I was here about 10 years ago. She was in the chorus of No, 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 Net. And uh, it was lovely to meet her and know her because any connection with the Duke is for me, well, history. I didn't know him terribly well. I, I, when I was starting, of course, he was the, the big uh, noise at the Cotton Club, Three Dukes. And, um, of course, Adelaide I've known right through the years. And um, Edith, Edith Wilson, really, I met in London. Uh, I knew about her, of course, but I first met her in London. I can't remember what it was she was in. Neither can she, for that matter. But... Um, uh, I'd never met Nell, and uh, who else did I? I think uh, the, the rest of my, I, I'd met, yes. Mm. Uh, who else have we? Um, this is a terrible